Titus chapter 2 But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with you on this Sunday morning as we share uh, together, as we worship God together. Uh, my name is Pastor Lou DiLorenzo. Um, I'm here at Cross Culture Church of Christ. I want to welcome all those who are part of our community, but all those who are watching here uh, on our uh, live stream this morning as well. It's great to be with each and every one of you. And it's, I'm so glad to be with you here uh, during a time of such uh, turmoil and, and difficulty in our community and in, in, in our uh, city and, of course, in our country as well. Uh, I know that the coronavirus pandemic has, uh, has really caused a lot of fear in the hearts of uh, many of us. Uh, we need to all make sure that we keep safe uh, during this period. That's really important for all of us. Make sure that you uh, do just keep abreast of what the government is saying and uh, make sure that you do those things uh, diligently as well. But you know, this is a great time for us as Christians to show our Christian love in our community uh, as well. It's uh, wonderful for Christians to be involved and helping where we can uh, at a time such as this. Uh, you might like to uh, make sure that uh, your neighbours and other people who, perhaps the vulnerable people, uh, perhaps you could do something to uh, help and assist them, uh, give them a phone call, perhaps you're able to uh, buy or do their shopping for them. Uh, certainly keep in touch with people by phone or by internet. We can pray with people uh, over the phone as well. It's a great thing to do. I mean, this is an important time for all of us to certainly be praying for one another. And, and perhaps this is a great time for us to really work on our prayer life as well. It's certainly a great time to be spending much time on our knees uh, here in our country and in the world today. Uh, let's make sure that our Christian faith is something that is really put in action uh, at this time of year. Uh, at the, the end of our service, we're going to have a time of communion together, and I'd just like to ask you to uh, prepare for that. We're going to share the emblems, so perhaps you could uh, just uh, prepare a, a glass, perhaps of uh, juice, or if you don't have that, then just some water, and also uh, take a biscuit and, and some, or some bread, and we'll be sharing communion uh, together at the end of the sermon. Today we're continuing in our series in the book of Titus. This is our second sermon uh, in that, that, in that uh, book. We're looking at Titus chapter 2, uh, the gospel impact in the home. And so this is a, a wonderful topic for us to be doing at a time when so many of us are spending uh, so much more of our time at home. There's also a, a Bible study guide that goes uh, with this series. You can download it off our website uh, and also uh, make sure that you do that study. Uh, I know all of our life groups are still uh, uh, going uh, online, of course. Uh, so 
perhaps you could do it in your life group. If you're not able to do it with your life group, then perhaps you can do it with your family or other people that you live with in your home. This is a great time to really be getting into God's word uh, together. I was brought up uh, in a migrant family who came to Australia in order to get a better life. I mean, they were farmers. Uh, they were uh, people with, with quite low education, my, my parents. And uh, you know, they came here uh, to make a better life for themselves and for their family. They, they were hardworking people. And uh, they also had very strong family values. But what if a child is brought up in a home of uh, criminal, uh, violent criminal people. Can you just imagine what that would be like? I mean, he'd be taught uh, that the only way to get ahead in life is to lie, cheat and steal. I mean, it'd be learning that it's just a dog eat dog world. The only way to make it is to look after yourself only. You know, I knew a, a guy who uh, came from that kind of background. And I remember him uh, sharing with me, he, he told me one time about his family. He said, you know, every weekend we would uh, get together with other family and friends in, in, in one person's house. And we would just, they would just drink and gamble and cause lots of trouble. Often the police uh, would have to come along on those occasions. And he said, that's how I was brought up. That's the world that I knew. I didn't know there was anything different. I thought everyone uh, grew up like that. But now just imagine if that child is adopted into another family, another home. You know, a family with really different values. A parents who showed love towards uh, themselves and towards others, kindness, self-control, uh, people who looked out for other people. Uh, showed loving care uh, to uh, the stranger. Uh, perhaps people who gave rather than uh, took. Now, saved from a life of crime and prison, what would that child want to do? They would want to really just totally embrace that new lifestyle and, and take it on and, and learn it and then live out that lifestyle uh, themselves as well. They would enjoy that lifestyle so much. Well, that's exactly what uh, Paul is telling Titus to do in this chapter. He's saying, teach these new, uh, um, sorry, teach these new Christians at Crete, teach them uh, about what a new person they are through the gospel, a new person they are in Christ today now. And so teach them how to live that godly life today. Now, in chapter one of Titus, uh, Paul and Titus, of course, they had gone on this missionary journey and they went to Crete. Uh, while they were there, they planted a number of churches. And then Paul left t uh, Titus to stay in Crete in order to build up the churches that they had established uh, there. That was Titus's job uh, given to him by the apostle uh, Paul. Titus was appointed really, he was appointed as a leader. He was appointed there to teach and to train leaders in these churches. This was a really important job for him to do because, of course, there was a lot of false teachers as well on the island of Crete. And, of course, Cretan society, it was a really tough game. It was a really difficult kind of society, very different from the Christian faith. Uh, and that's uh, much like our society today, isn't it? Now let's turn to our passage, uh, the first 10 verses. And uh, the title of this section is How to Live My Everyday Life. After speaking about these uh, false teachers and uh, uh, doing, you know, Paul turns uh, uh, then to, to Titus and he says to him, But as for you, Titus, as for you, your responsibility, Titus, is to be a true teacher, unlike these false teachers who are here. Uh, your job is to do sound teaching. Now, this word sound in the Greek, it actually means to be well, to be healthy. See, it gives you uh, the sense of 
um, being healthy, being whole, being without disease. You see, it's all about God's Word. Not just part of God's Word, but all of God's Word. Uh, not mixed with other kinds of, of religion, but pure and teaching uh, that comes from God's Word is healthy and beneficial to each and every one of us. And that's really great to know, isn't it? Now, in verses 2 to 10, Paul speaks about uh, six different kinds of people. And we're going to look at that in, in a little bit of detail now. Now, in the, uh, in the community uh, where the Cretans were, of course, this was a community where, where basically where you lived and where you work wasn't too far apart at all. And everyone lived very closely together uh, as well. Their lives were totally visible to one another, 24-7, 365 days a year. You know, in the nuts and bolts of everyday life, it's really, really hard to uh, show, um, you know, you can't fake a genuine life. You can't fake a godly life in that kind of environment. So let's look at these. First of all, um, he speaks about older men. Talks about them, you know, needing to be self-controlled, needing to be sound in their faith, in their love, in steadfastness. In, you know, in other words, the older, um, experienced men uh, live a life, guys. Live a life that that's a good example to others that others want to follow. Uh, you're the kind of person in the church that we look to for wisdom. The older men. If I don't know what to do, then you're the ones that I'm going to come and speak to. Bring your solid, your unwavering walk with God to the rest of us. That's your job, older men. Then he speaks about the older women. Um, you know, teach what is good and, and make sure that uh, they train up the younger women in the community. You see, Older women are to be mentors to the younger women. And Titus couldn't do that. I mean, he couldn't do that himself. And neither can I. I can't do it. So we need you older women to be doing that in the church, to be doing that, bringing up, teaching and training the younger women in our community. Then he speaks about the younger women. Now, in the context of that time, of course, uh, almost all the younger women would be married. But whether you are married or not, we, we can learn something from this. Working at home, it really emphasises diligence and uh, you know, not allowing ourselves to be idle. Uh, don't be busybodies, don't be gossips. And you can see that if you look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 13 as well. Uh, Paul speaks about that there too. We need to use our time really wisely. Don't sit around on Facebook or the internet all day long. Make sure we use our time wisely. It says there to be pure. Be pure in all of your thoughts and in what you do as well. You know, be careful about what you allow into your mind. Be careful what, you, what you're watching on TV, on, on YouTube. Take care in, in the way that you dress and, you know, and understand why you are dressing that way. And think of others when we dress as well. Young men. Now, young men, of course, we know can be very impulsive. Uh, they can be easily led by their own desires. And so the number one thing that Paul says here is talking to them about being self-controlled. Such important thing for young men. And then Paul goes on to speak uh, directly to Titus, who, of course, is a young man, a young teacher himself. He says, teach showing integrity, dignity and sound speech. You see, Titus, you know, as a spiritual teacher at that time, he's got to be sure that what he's teaching is sound doctrine, that it's beyond reproach. You know, a Bible teacher has to study the Word of God for themselves diligently so that they understand it as, as fully and well as they can. And then they need to live that teaching out in their own life in order to be able to teach other people. And then he moves on to bond servants. 
Now, bond servants were basically household workers. Often they were bonded for life uh, in that service, but they weren't treated as harshly as we think uh, about slavery. So it's really, it's more applicable to an employee of today. And uh, Paul says, you employees, be trustworthy, but be honest and loyal to your boss, to the person that you're working for. That way, your work will be a wonderful witness for the gospel uh, to your boss and, and all the people that you work with as well. Now, we don't have time to go through all of the, the virtues that Paul speaks about here, but what I want to talk to, but I want to talk about two in particular. Firstly, self-control. Uh, mentioned a number of times here in verses 2, 5, and also in verse 6. Self-controls about controlling you know, our thoughts, our behavior, our impulses, and our desires very much as well. To be in control of you know, our sinful passions, uh, particularly when we are tempted and, and sometimes we find temptation so, so very difficult to handle, don't we? Much easier uh, said, of course, than done to be in total control of ourselves. You know, we live in a very materialistic country, don't we? The more people have, basically, then the more that they want. And, and it's easy for us as Christians to, to just be um, brought into that kind of thinking and uh, caught up in, in doing the same thing ourselves. Uh, David Mathis said these words, True self-control is not about bringing ourselves under our own control, but rather the power of Christ. You see, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. As we grow in our relationship with God, we'll grow in our spiritual maturity, in our spiritual discipline, in self-control as well. That's something that we really need to work hard on in our spiritual life. Perhaps you could ask uh, a more spiritually a mature person, a more spiritually mature man or woman in your life to help you to do that. Uh, we call that spiritual mentoring, and that's a wonderful thing for all of us to be involved in. Uh, for those of you who do have spiritual mentors, make sure that you keep meeting up with them. I know it's difficult at this time, but certainly you can uh, e-mentor at this stage. You know, use the internet. Uh, we're using Zoom. Uh, the pastoral team is using Zoom. You can use Skype, and there's so many. Uh, Facebook, of course, and other methods of us keeping in touch with each other. And for those on, uh, on uh, low internet uh, uh, understanding, we can, of course, use a telephone. So let's keep doing that. But if you don't have a mentor at this time, you know, perhaps you could ask someone to help you with that, to help you with your spiritual life. Uh, if you're not able to find someone yourself, you can ask a life group leader or certainly do send a message or ask me as well. The pastors, will be, uh, we really love helping people to find and be mentored. Secondly, be a good example, but be a model to others a model that can be Im imitated. Uh, be a pattern for others to follow in your life. Uh, three times in this passage, in verses 5, 8, and 10, it says there that the way you live shows the truth of the gospel. And that is so true. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. You know, if you're a pastor a ministry leader, a life group leader, if you're a parent, if you're a Christian, be it in your home or in your work. Other people are watching what you do. Other people are listening to what you say. And they want to understand if those two things come together. John Stott put it like this. Our lives can bring either adornment or discredit to the gospel. In uh, verses 1 to 10 here, we've been talking about, or Paul certainly has, he's been telling us about how to live. Now, as we go on to the next section in verses 11 to 14, he gives us the doctrinal basis of why we can and why we should live a godly life. Verse 11, For the grace of God, Jesus, 
has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. God has always been gracious to us. But now God's grace has come in the flesh. It's real. It's happening. It's now. Jesus came. He was tangible to the people there. Jesus had come to earth and died for my sins, for our sins, for all people, for young and for old, for men and for women, for slaves, and of course, for the Cretan people as well. You see, it's the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for each and every one of us that makes for godly living in our lives. John Stott put it like this. He said, It's not only that grace makes good works possible, enabling us to do them, but rather that grace makes them necessary, challenging us to live accordingly. And then we move on to verse 13, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. See, we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus. Why do we do that? We're waiting because we want to see uh, the world to see the glory of Jesus. We're waiting for our resurrected bodies so we'll have no more struggle with sin in our lives. We're waiting to be reunited with our loved ones who have died in Christ. We are waiting to live with Jesus in heaven forever and ever. So, you see, we live in the light of the two comings of Jesus. We look to the past, when Jesus came and died on the cross. We look to the future, when Jesus will come again and totally fulfill uh, his calling uh, to bring us to heaven. Remembering Jesus' death and looking forward to his return. You know, Jesus will return and then... When he does, when Jesus comes again, he's going to take away all the pain. He's going, to, he's going to take away all the sickness, including the coronavirus. And we'll have no more struggle with sin in our lives. What, that is something so great for us to look forward to, isn't it? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2. Beloved, we're God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared But what we know, that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We've got a lot to look forward to, haven't we, when Jesus returns again. Uh, My last point here uh, comes from verse 15, the authority of God's word. Titus spoke with the authority that came from the Apostle Paul. Now today, we speak with the authority that comes from God's word, the Bible. The authority, you see, is not in the speaker, it's in God's word. So what was Titus called to do here in verse 15? He was called to declare the Bible's message, regardless of any opposition. And here, he was going to have a lot of opposition but we're also called to communicate the gospel to people in a way that they can truly understand for themselves. So it's important for us to declare it to people so that they can understand it. He was called to exhort, that is to encourage people to take God's word really seriously and to put it into action in the way that they live their lives. But we also need to bring comfort to people as well through God's word, especially in times of trouble uh, like these. Let me just encourage you for this moment. Encourage you that with the coronavirus, you know, we all have concerns. And some of us um, uh, are struggling more than others are as well. And we need to be uh, um, very caring towards others uh, during a time like this. You know, perhaps you could contact someone in need, uh, perhaps you could be in touch with someone who's, who perhaps you feel maybe uh, a little bit more vulnerable. Um, people who um, can help them as well. Now, if you're struggling, then, then make sure that you reach out to someone. Reach out to your life group leader. Uh, if you don't have someone you can reach out to, then 
make sure that you contact one of the pastors, contact our church. Uh, if you need support, then we're able to um, either do that ourselves or find someone who can support you at a time like this. And, you know, we should be supporting each other. Um, uh, I, I find that uh, uh, when someone is, is really struggling, it can be really good to read uh, with them uh, one of the Psalms uh, that can really be encouraging to them. You know, reach out if you need any help at this time, and but also look for people that you can help and support uh, as well. Thirdly, um, Titus is told to rebuke, a strong word, isn't it? Exposing a person's sin to them, but in a way, in a way that they'll be convicted of their sin. So they really need to understand the truth of, of any rebuke that you are saying to them. And then with God's help, that they would actually be able to change their life accordingly. Uh, rebuke sounds very harsh. Sometimes it needs to be, but it has the motivation of wanting to change the person to be more like Christ. You know, we are to know the truth, to teach the truth, and to live out God's truth for us. Let me read to you um, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. They're great words, aren't they? Let God's word pierce into your heart so that we may know him more. See, godliness is a life that flows from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. In this time of, of great turmoil in our world today, it's even more important you know, for each one of us to know and understand uh, the truth of the gospel. Um, and other people need to see that by the way that we live our lives as well. I just want to uh, ask all of us to uh, just take a few moments with the Lord at this moment. Uh, time to just reflect on how he has been speaking into your heart. Uh, let's close our eyes and uh, let's talk with God. How might God um, be speaking to you through this passage? How might he be shaping your life or your ministry? If you're an older man, how could your life be you know, just a better example to others? If you're an older woman, is there a, a younger woman you know, that you could be helping more? If you're a young man, then... Perhaps God is asking you to really look at an area in your life that you need to be uh, more, in more control of. And for younger women, perhaps there's something more that you could be doing uh, for your family. Or how could you be more pure um, in the way that you are living your life? Let's speak with God at this moment. Lord God, we want to, uh, we, each one of us want to live a godly life. Help us today to say no to the temptations in our lives and to, that you might teach us how we can do this each day, each day, Lord. May we always uh, depend on you and Lord, help us to love your word and to study it daily to look forward to Jesus' return and to tell others about the good news of the gospel as well, Lord. May your grace and the power of the Holy Spirit be with us today and each day. Amen. Amen.